it's now my real pleasure to introduce Rita Rosenbach, who is not only a very dear friend, <laughs> but also a family language coach assisting families uh, to make the most of their languages and also holds workshops and presentations and in this summit, for example, for parents and educators on the topic of bilingual and multilingual children. She's the author of Bringing Up a Bilingual Child, an easy to read practical guide for parents raising their children to speak more than one language. On her website, you can find many articles and Q&As, <laughs> like the ones that we had now on the topic. And in her Multilingual Parenting Facebook group, you can join the discussions and share experiences on raising children to speak more than one language too. Her Finnish company, Multilingual Parenting, is one of the project partners of Peach. And Rita also co-authored the Peach Guide for Parents, How to Raise a Bilingual Child, and the Peach Guide for Educators, How to Support Multilingual Children. She also runs the Peach Ambassador Network, consisting of over 200 language enthusiasts across Europe and the world, because we are expanding, mm -hmm. and oversees the Peach online collection of resources that have more than 1,000 links to language resources in 24 EU languages. And I may add, she is also one of my partners in multilingualism at the broadcast Raising Multilinguals Live, together with Tetsu Young, who is maybe in the room. Yes, he is here. So the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Raising bilingual ch uh, a child, how to deal with resistance from others. So I will speak about the different scenarios um, when, let's say you have decided that you want to raise a bilingual child, you, you are really, really um, keen about it, you, are, you want to speak about it, you, you, you're de de determined, and then you mention it to someone and you might get a, a kind of, mm, nah, you might get unsolicited advice, you, you get a reaction which is not at all enthusiastic as you would expect. So how do you deal with these situations? We have a lot of research about um, situations, um, about uh, what, how a bilingual child develops and, and um, which kind of environments are, are um, uh, beneficial and, and what to do and what not to do. But uh, I often find that it's a, uh, it is it's uh, also important to give very hands-on advice to as to how to react in a certain situations. So that's why I decided to have do my speech on this. There are two basic principles that you must keep in mind um, because they will make you make your life so much uh, easier. So first of all, pick your battles. Use your energy for those who are open to listening and le learning. You know you have read your books, you have read the articles, you have joined parent groups, you have asked questions that you didn't know, so you, you have that knowledge. Remember that others may not have it, and uh, not everybody is open to, to listening to, to these. And so if someone questions anything you are doing, um, you don't necessarily want to go into a discussion. You can go something like, let me look that up. If somebody says you are confusing your child, you say, well, let me look that up. I think there is some research about that and I will get back to you. And then if you do want to get back to them, you do. If you don't, you don't have to. It is your decision to raise a bilingual child. You do not have to justify it uh, uh, to, to some stranger that claims uh, that comes with some, some myth or something. Um, sometimes it's just better not to say anything else and say anything or, or then wait for the right moment before the speaks. Uh, you can say, thank you for your thoughts and then change the subject and speak about uh, something else or just smile and walk away. Uh, you do not have to go into these, uh, these discussions uh, if, if uh, Anybody, let's say another parent or in a group, in a discussion group, you don't have to go into, you don't have to justify what, what you're doing. Pick your battles. Parenting is uh, not an easy, easy task at the, at the best of days. 
So the second uh, principle to remember might be a bit more difficult to grasp, but um, uh, bear with me here because uh, it will this will make your um, situation so much easier if you think about that every action has a positive intention. So the intention is there and the intention of the speaker is a positive outcome, either for themselves or for you. So unsolicited advice may be wrong, it may still be well meant and it comes from a right place. So put yourself in the other person's shoes before you respond. Um, think of why is this person saying this? So don't do an immediate response. Why is this person saying this? Um, and what is the positive intention? We will go into this. They will be wise for the different situations. So I will explain in more detail later. Um, and remember that even if you understand, it doesn't not have to mean, and it shouldn't mean that you agree with them. But the process of trying to understand where another person comes from helps you in having a more constructive discussion with that person. It applies for any discussion. But but here, uh, because language can is a very personal thing. It can be hurtful when someone says something that that we don't agree with. So trying to to put yourself in the other person's um, position and hold your breath before you answer. So resistance uh, can come from, from many different um, people and in different scenarios. And uh, and I'll go through them one by one, one by one. I'll answer the questions afterwards uh, when we have uh, when I've gone through the, the the presentation. I will make sure that there is enough time for questions. So first, resistance from the other pa parent. Uh, because this is, like I mentioned in the Q&A before, that, a, a question that I get quite often, that um, uh, some of these stories are really heartbreaking when one parent really wants to pass on their language and, and the other parent is less enthusiastic uh, in doing so. You need to go to the bottom. This is a very important, it's a very fundamental question in a uh, family, and it is important that. Um, parents agree on on how to uh, go about the languages in the family what family family language strategy should you have because if you are not in agreement it it can be very difficult especially for the for the parent who is speaking the lesser spoken uh, spoken language so find that um, common ground try to in, understand and then address those concerns. So when you listen to each other, uh, think when you hear, for example, that the other parent says, I feel left out. Um, don't take it as an accusation that you are leaving me out. It is an expression of how the other person feels, and that is important. Uh, it is also an expression uh, that uh, that the other parent is keen on having a good relationship with the child and is concerned that if the child doesn't uh, learn the language he or she is speaking, then they might not um, have such a good good bond with the child. So these are important and very relevant. Question. So if a person, if a parent says, well, I don't want you to speak that language, don't take it, uh, take it uh, like literally that they are against the language. They are against, they are for being able to connect with their own child. And it comes out and, and their solution in their mind is that you wouldn't speak. Uh, the language. So discuss about it and explain how important, I, I always um, 
um, emphasize how important it is to speak about the feelings about our languages and express why it is uh, important. And then what you can do in a scenario like this is um, uh, hopefully you can have the discussion, come to an agreement that the person who doesn't understand asks when it is necessary. These situations are different in different families. The, the dynamics are, are different. So I can't tell you, I can't give you a script. This is how you should go about it. You know your parent and your family best, but come to a mutual understanding, share your feelings, agree on, on what you do when. So the other person, the other parent or carer should let you know if they do feel left out and so you can address that situation so it's not um, it doesn't become a big issue. Um, it is always good if if you can agree that the person who doesn't understand is the one asking oh now I didn't understand because the fact is that the more the other uh, person who who claims that they don't know the language or they don't know that language, the more they hear and especially hear it in everyday situations in where you can understand from the context what's being said, the more they will learn about the, uh, learn about the language at least to understand it. And that's a big step, step. Little, but little by little that can be um, built upon, especially when the, uh, the um, attitudes are, are right, so you won't want to learn. Sometimes there could be a resentment um, towards the language or, or, or the culture. Um, um, if this is the case, then that's a deeper issue that needs to be discussed. discussed. So why would uh, the other parent have a resentment? Why is this? And then you ask, well, what is the positive intention of that? The positive intention of a, of a person who resents another language to be used, the positive intention for themselves is that they want to know what's happening, they want always to understand, and they are concerned of not being included, like, uh, like I mentioned here in the concerns of being left out. That is the positive, their positive intention is to get to a situation where they can always understand and it can come out as resentment. Um, quite often, um, parents do not have the right information. Um, we were, just before we were supposed to listen to Thomas Bach speaking about um, the language, uh, children do not confuse, and that is a fact, that's a, uh, Children do not get confused by being spoken to in many languages. There will be another session about that. Sorry about the jumping around here. Um, and their parents might also be unaware of the, of the potential benefits. So, so please read up on, on, um, on all the information, read our guide, listen to, watch our videos, listen to the expert and these sessions, there will be recordings of them, and uh, learn beyond with, with a lot of information. That is um, perhaps the most important thing for you to do, so you can lead this discussion with the, armed with the inf right information. And then we'll go a bit to extended family uh, from a grandparent or another relative. They might say, well, no, don't. I don't want you to speak that this language because, again, they are afraid they're not going to understand the child, or they're worried they will not be able to create a bond with the child. So again, why? What's the positive intention or of their when they express themselves like this? The positive intention there is they actually it comes from a place of love. They love their grandchild. They're maybe it's the first grandchild. They're really excited um, that they, they, they have met this new wonderful human being and they love it, love the child. They want to bond with it. And then when they hear the child being spoken to in a language that they don't understand, um, it is understandable that they might react uh, kind of in a way 
indicating that they do not like you to speak the language with them. Again, share the information, understand, don't make the situation, the conflict situation, try to avoid that at, as best as you can. And um, share the information, say that, uh, and uh, inform them about the things that you already, already know about. Again, yes, like as a parent, they can be misinformed and there can be this kind of resentment as well. Um, but you can also ask that if, if, they, if there's a situation that they expect you to, to choose a language, then usually this involves two different sets of parents. So there would be actually a choice between not um, passing on the language or one of sets of the grandparents. So there's always that, uh, that um, aspect as well. Next, I know we have a lot of teachers here and I'm happy you're here because I know you won't be one of the teachers that I will be speaking about next. Uh, we have many wonderful teachers among, amongst our uh, ambassadors and, um, and, uh, and these, uh, I'm happy to hear, I've, I've seen it happening. There's more and more understanding about the um, bilingual and multi multilingual children in the, in the classroom. Um, but there still needs, there's still work to be done. And that's why we wrote the guide. So if you come across any of the teachers who are negative towards uh, additional languages, then please uh, um, send a link to the, uh, the um, educator's guide. So. Uh, so they can have a read. Quite often it is that um, they're misinformed as well, saying they're afraid that bilingualism will negatively affect school success. But well, we heard, for example, in, in um, Antonella's uh, speech yesterday, presentation, uh, that this is absolutely not, they're not, not the case. In, in many cases, the contrary is true, and a strong home language uh, also supports the school language. In some scenarios, uh, uh, teachers are uncomfortable with non-school languages being spoken. And it's again, uh, the, the situation about not understanding and, and being unsure about the situation. Um, and it's that it's just easier to to do to have one language in the school. There are many ways of integrating languages, and uh, even uh, it doesn't mean. And they expect we cannot. Teachers do not have an easy job. They have a lot on their plate. There are big expectation expectations. There's no way we can expect that they would be able to learn even a little of, of every single language that they, they have in their classroom, because there are classrooms that can be 30 or 40 different, uh, different languages. Um, so their positive attention, uh, teachers' positive attention is that they want to be sure that their children learn, learn the school language, and they want to be able to to uh, be part of the discussions in the classroom that is their positive intention it then comes out in a way that is neg negative for uh, for multilingual children um, so the, our our duty as educators as ambassadors and parents in the know is to share the information about um, how it is possible to make um, classrooms and daycare multilingual friendly, so to say. Sometimes doctors can um, comment on, uh, on um, language development, especially if they suspect there's a bit of a delay, they can tell you to, to, sh to stop uh, speaking a language. 
unfortunately this still happens. This is incorrect and old information. Research has shown over and over again that this is not the truth. This is not uh, the fact. So why are they saying, what is their positive intention? Their positive intention is that they want to give the best advice and that is the best advice they know about. Um, so they, they want your child to do well and they think by giving this uh, advice they are doing a service but they're not um, I understand it's not easy to to resist an authority a doctor can be a real authority and you can feel that no I can't say anything well you don't have to contradict them in that situation but please do not take an advice to drop a language from a doctor because it is not the the, the right advice. Uh, doctors are not trained to assess language development, even less uh, uh, bilingual for bilingual and multilingual children. If you have concerns, please do uh, contact a, a speech and language therapist, but make sure you find one who can deal with uh, bilingual and multilingual children. There are less and less of speech and language therapists who of the same reason as doctors give the, the advice to drop a language. But please, please do remember that some years ago, it was still in the education of speak and, speech and language therapists to recommend that um, a multilingual family drops a language to help the child. So this is not something that they come up with. It was in actually in their education this has now been changed and is changing all the positive to, to, to a more positive view of, of bilingualism and multilingualism and also if they only use monolingual standards um, to assess all the all the uh, languages that's also not right there are many different tools that the speech and language therapist can use to get to the right result for, for a child who speaks more than one language. And also it's wrong to only measure the language that the therapist is familiar with. This doesn't, again, doesn't mean that uh, the therapist will have to know all the languages because Mary Pat will be the right person to, uh, to tell you about this, but there are tools they can use, they can cooperate to make sure that the child gets the right support. And then last, uh, we already touched on this in, in the, in the Q&As, uh, what to do with the resistance from others in the community. Because you can hear sentences like this, it's rude to speak a language not everyone understands when you are out and about. If you are in a communication situation, where it is important that everybody understands, then of course you should use the language that everybody uses. And even if you are consistent with your child by switching to the language that everybody communicates in, you are being the bilingual role model um, for your child and switching to the language that, um, that is necessary at that point. But let's say uh, you are out in plane in the park with your child and uh, you speak, because that's what you always speak, you speak uh, the, your family language, and uh, somebody comments on that it's rude to speak uh, a language not everyone understands. Um, you might, I wouldn't answer anything to, to a question necessary uh, to someone who says something like that. You can just um, question in your mind, that is, has that person ever been abroad? Um, have they miraculously started speaking the, the, that country's language? And if they're English, English speakers, if they say everybody understands English, well, that's not true. Um, is it, would it be, for example, I live in Scotland at the moment, would it be offensive to speak Gaelic here? Because um, uh, that's no language not everybody understands up here. No, of course, it wouldn't be offensive. So. It's not about the language, it's about something else. Um, and then there is the, in this country we speak this language, uh, 
where we know there are other reasons, um, underlying reasons why people say that. The positive intentions of these people, because there are every, every action has a positive intention, is that they actually want a scenario where everybody speaks um, the same language and that is their positive intention for themselves. It's only for themselves, it is not for us to speak more than one language. Um, I actually, I don't want to end, end on a negative note. Uh, uh, I was once told um, to, I was speaking Swedish with my daughters when I was out, out and about, and we were only speaking Swedish because, it, yeah, it was just between us. And somebody then commented uh, that I should go back to the cake country I came from, and probably they thought I wouldn't understand. And I turned around and I smiled. I said, I do that quite often. And you are actually welcome there too. And that diffused this situation. But um, you can just smile and walk away. You do not have to answer. So thank you. Those were my, my, that was my quick presentation about different scenarios where you might uh, might have um, have to deal with people who are not as enthusiastic as you are with regards to the, the multilingualism. So please uh, stop sharing. Uta, please welcome to switch your uh, camera on. And um, I'm happy to answer some questions. So we have to wait for some questions. I think you, you answered them all somehow, <laughs> probably, already with your presentation. So <clears throat> no questions left. So yes, I, I like this approach of uh, choose your battles. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes it's uh, wiser to walk away, especially, I think, when you see also how our children react to these situations, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. When they get scared or they uh, they feel like, we are the odd ones and why is this person saying this to you yeah uh, yes I've absolutely several yeah times. absolutely um, remove yourself and uh, in a sc yeah. scenario like that if your child gets upset or you feel uncomfortable remove yourself from the situation speak about it afterwards with your children so don't just kind of walk away and never speak no. about it go go home and and in the safe environment have some nice food and and sit together and speak about it so and then explain and uh, you can use this this kind of um mind switch in 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 uh, in how people see things differently yeah. You don't have to defend people like this, but it is important for your child also to be able to, to react and, and not, not take it too much to heart because like, we can't be next to our children all, all of the, all the time. time. And we need to kind of um, give them the, the, the tools to deal with situations like this. Yes. There is a question from Ricky McGee, who is also one of the, the Peach Ambassadors. Yeah. Where we are based in Catalonia, Spain, all children receive bilingual education, Spanish and Catalan. How do you approach resistance to learning a third language? Like, like we have said, there are reasons to speak a language. For a child, it's important that there is a, a need and a want to learn a language. If, if a child, children are very pragmatic, if they see no reason uh, to, to learn a language, if they, well, I have no use for it, I, I won't be doing this, that, or the other. So if, if you can't create a scenario where the children feel that they, they need it, or if, if there is no real reason, uh, then what can you do? I mean, depending on the age of the child, maybe when they're a bit older, you can refer to, well, it is useful for your career and so on. But forcing a child to speak a language where the child doesn't see the point of learning it. So it is up to us adults to explain it in a way, to make it enticing, to make the child want to speak. It, the, it's the need and okay. the want to speak a language. Those two things are important. 
Yes, and, and maybe leading by example, if you say, oh, that's a fun language. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. There is another question from Rebecca. Uh, do you have any tips on how to address a natural imbalance in how much each parent speaks with a child, not just because of time restrictions, but because they are naturally less chatty by nature? In my case, my husband speaks many languages really well. We are aligned in our multilingual approach for our son, but he is simply quieter than me, or I speak more than the <laughs> average Joe, smiley. <laughs> yes, I, I understand. I understand the situation. And I, I always want to say that, well, take a look at the situation. Is it, is it that you have different communication styles and, and that one parent Yes, it's quieter, but does it mean that the other parent is actually filling in every empty space in 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 the in the discussion? I always bring up the kind of Finnish Finnish uh, typical uh, kind of attitude where in in when you speak in Finnish with a Finnish person, pauses are important and they should be left at uh, pauses. They should not be filled up because if you fill up every pause uh, with a Finnish person, they speak less and less and less and less because there needs to be some quiet time in a discussion. Yeah. Um, yes, there, there is also a nice uh, practice that um, speech therapists use. It is, uh, the acronym is OWL. You remember we talked about that. It's, it's uh, observe, wait and listen. Mm -hmm. That makes yeah. children speak more. Uh, if we give them the chance to do so. But anyway, yeah. and, uh, Diana. But, but also, what I wanted to add kind of um, speak speak about the situation like that. So what, because quite often I've noticed even quiet people do want to speak about something. They, they are really interested in a certain topic. So maybe they can spend time with their children doing things they, are, they enjoy. And maybe you as the more talkative uh, parent at that point step back and let the discussion happen. Uh, Rita, it's a funny thing, sorry if I laugh, but uh, Rebecca, who asked this question, she just added, my husband is Finnish and I'm British. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you got it. <laughs> there is another question from Diana. For sure there are benefits for the bilingual children to follow mother uh, tongue or home language education, but there might be also child's resistance to attend heritage language school because it usually takes place on weekends or after school what is your advice in such situations? It's a very good question. Thank it you, is Diana. a very good question. And um, all of it. Yes. Um, if you happen to follow Racing Multilinguals Live, we actually, last session we did was on heritage language schools. But uh, to, to, again, the want and the need. If your child does not want to go, it, so is that school right for your child? are they using the right approach or is it is it um does the feel does it, the child feel either bored or kind of um maybe intimidated because they don't know it as the language as well as they can or are the methods kind of outdated um, me methods where you kind of go through grammar and and not and then do not include the joy of languages because a child to be drawn to a language should be, feel joy about the language. So I wouldn't, I would never force a child to attend a heritage school. Uh, instead, visit the heritage school, see how they're doing. Maybe you can help. Maybe you can come with some suggestions. It's all different the dynamics, of course, but. Uh, I don't think there is uh, there is a, a, an answer to how can I force my child to attend a heritage school but because you can't and you shouldn't because you can do more harm than than good. Maybe you can agree with your child. Okay, you do not have to go to school, but we will use that time um, to to have intensive discussions and you can make a plan. Okay, today and you can choose the topic. And but today we'll we'll speak uh, about this uh, topic. So so you can um, use that language uh, that that time to your benefit. Absolutely yes, that's what many families did, and we did it as well. Yeah. Susanna has another question. My husband is a native French speaker, but he keeps speaking English to our son. 
I keep telling him to speak in his native language because I don't want our child to lose the French language. How can I make him stop? What are good arguments? Um, again, have the discussion um, and uh, speak about your goals. Does he want the children? Uh, I mean, you need to kind of go to the very bottom bottom of this. Uh, is, is he actually of the, the opinion that your children doesn't don't need French? Because if that is his opinion, I think you are up against a wall because you cannot force another adult person to speak a language they do not want to. But if you come, if you discuss it and, and he says, no, no, I do want them to be, be yeah, learn French, then you have a good basis to stand on and you can continue the discussion and said, okay, yes, we agreed about this. Children should learn French. Now let's see how we can do it. And, and how we can make sure that they get enough exposure. And then you can take it from there and build build from there. But please do make it a, a kind of a, a discussion between the two of you and in agreement. And these discussions are not ones to be held when, when you're stressed, when you're busy. These discussions should be held when, when it's quiet and calm and, and you can make good decisions. Yes, and sometimes also not necessarily in the presence of the children. Right? No, Especially absolutely when no. There are discussions that um, involve feelings and yeah. that. Absolutely, Perfect. good point. In the spirit, Sarah has now another question. In the spirit of equality, diversity, and inclusion, do you think initiatives like the, Spe uh, the Peach Project can influence government worldwide to place more importance on? funding and strategic vision on the importance of early years education and multilingualism? The short answer is yes. I definitely believe that we can have a big impact, but not as the PEACH project, but the individuals that make the whole project, all the ambassadors. Uh, again, I come back to, to ambassadors, which I, I love from the bottom of my heart, um, because they can make this one person can't do it, one project can't do it, one, one, one campaign can't do it. But there are enough of us saying this over and over again, coming with the right arguments, knowing our facts, speaking about um, the important things. Yes, we can make a difference. I definitely believe that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. We have another comment from uh, Valeria. So I am Mexican and I live in Italy. My mother-in-law is afraid my baby won't understand Italian and she says she won't be able to understand her because I only speak Spanish to the baby. And she gets mad when she hears me speaking Spanish with my baby. And she says, Valeria, also tell her the words in Italian, but I don't want to because my baby for sure is gonna learn Italian anyways. It's going to be her first language. I only care on teaching her Spanish because when she goes to school or interact with other people, Italian will be her first language. Am I correct? You are absolutely correct. That's exactly. I mean, tell tell your mother-in-law, please. You it you you are the expert in Italian. I'm not the expert. You are the expert. I want her to learn from you. You tell her you speak. You tell her the different words, and then you speak with her in Italian. Um, so in, involve the parents. Say thank you for your concern. Um, my duty as a mother is to pass on my language, and uh, I, I welcome all the help you can give in uh, teaching her Italian. You're doing the right thing. Absolutely, yes. Uh, giving everyone the task or a role yeah. in the upbringing of the yeah. multilingual child is something that empowers every single person. To build a vil village around your, your multilingual exactly. child, yes. yes. Um, do we have um, other questions? I think we have uh, only one minute left here. Yes, so there is an answer from Eugenia Papadaki, who is also one of our uh, Peach Ambassadors, and she's educator. Uh, she replied, I think, to Susanna, if I'm right. May I uh, read it? Her Absolutely, response? yeah. I mean, there's, we, we should move over. We don't yes. want to keep uh, Jessica. Yes. 
and I'll I just it. yeah okay then I just read it very quickly your husband need to see the need and the use for this yeah so it was about the French and uh, yeah one of the strongest arguments could be how would he feel if the child goes to France and cannot communicate with the family members there he will understand the multiple advantages hopefully later or not it depends on the person and we have to respect the choice yeah. of everyone so. Okay, keep uh, copy your questions that we don't have time to. We now will have to switch over. We don't want to keep uh, Jessica Paolillo Jessica. and Alicia Alonso Capas waiting. Thank you very much, you. everyone, for participating. Thank you, Rita, for this uh, excellent talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being here.